Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of February 6th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the hypocrisy of Alaska's moderates. They want to be seen as moderate, but they want to do it with someone else's money. Second, we explain that why the BLM's pending approval of Conoco's Willow project is an important thing from an economic perspective. Its ultimate contribution to a fiscal solution is uncertain. And third, we explain why Rahm Emanuel's admonition of never let a crisis go to waste kept coming to mind when we read the latest story about the looming Cook Inlet gas crisis. And now, let's join Michael. We're going to start off in my favorite land. That is the land of hypocrisy. That is my favorite vacation destination uh, because so many people seem to be visiting there. Uh, The hypocrisy of Alaskan moderates. We need to discuss. Tell me what's uh, give me your thoughts on this. Let's uh, let's get started. Well, this got triggered by a recent article in the Ketchikan Daily News of all places that I'll refer to here in just a second. But but here here's the setup for it. Moderates in the lower 48 typically say we need more spending, right? But they also at least are self-conscious enough or humble enough or aware enough to say we need more spending and I'm willing to I'm willing to play my part. I'm willing to to pay a percentage part, uh, play my proportionate part uh, in that additional spending. Um, and moderates in the lower 48 also are focused not only on spending issues, they're focused on revenue design. I mean, that's where you get all the battles between sales taxes and income taxes and, and using the flat tax as sort of a middle road landing spot. But it's but they're always focused on equally focused on spending. We've got to spend more on in certain areas. And revenue design, we've got to make sure that we spread that burden of additional spending equitably uh, through uh, throughout all uh, all income brackets, and not focus it just on lower income brackets like a or middle and lower income brackets like a sales tax does. Um, and and it, those those two issues go hand in hand. Alaska moderates are great at um, are great at focusing on spending. I mean they. You, they're pushing for additional K through 12 spending. They're pushing for additional defined benefits. They're pushing now for additional university spending. They're pushing for, you know, a variety of additional spending categories. But when it comes to who pays for that, unlike the moderates in the lower 48 or in the rest of the world, the the moderates up here are going, who, me pay? No, I don't. No, 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 no. That's not fair. We need to push it down on middle and lower income Alaska families through uh, through PFD cuts. That's the way. We need to pay for it. And on revenue design, uh, an issue that, as I say, is equally important to moderates in the lower 48 uh, and elsewhere in the world. uh, On revenue design, you can't find one Alaska moderate who talks about it at all. It's 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 always it's always well, PFD cuts. That's just you know, that's just the way that's just the way we're going to do it. And uh, and and let's not talk about any of this, any of this other stuff. Um, so what, what you really have is a hypocrisy up here uh, of the moderates or the moderates are in a hypocrisy up here of saying, yeah, yeah, spend, push, push forward on all spending, on all spending fronts, K through 12, defined benefit plans, um, uh, university, anything else I can come up with. 
uh, push forward on all spending uh, fronts. But but when it comes to paying for it, they're nowhere to be found. It's like, right. you know, I'm in the top 20 percent as all legislators with maybe the exception of two. I'm in the top 20 percent. Um, I don't want to pay for it. Yeah, I don't want to talk about that. So I'm moderate on some things, but but man, I'm not moderate on uh, um, on uh, 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 on the revenue side. I'm a plutocrat, or I'm a I'm a uh, 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 an elitist, a top 20, 20 top twenty percent elitist when it comes to when it comes to the revenue side. Here's the thing that brought it home for me. This is this is a report in the Ketchikan Daily News, which is a great way to keep in touch with Southeast, by the way. Right. Uh, in the in the Ketchikan Daily News, a report on a meeting of their congressional delegation, uh, who they who they quickly point out five of six are, of, of whom are former teachers. Uh, their their representative dele- their legislative delegation with uh, with with Ketchikan and and here's Dan Ortiz um, from Ketchikan the representative from Ketchikan talking. The reality is, while the members of the legislature are saying publicly that they support an increment to the BSA because they're hearing from their districts that that's needed, we can't have that at least a significant one and also have a full PFD or the statutory PFD, Ortiz continued, those two things won't work unless you're willing to overdraw the earnings reserve. Uh, Dan, there's another option. You pay for it. You pay a proportionate part. (laughs) So therefore, it's really simple, he continued. If we we want to have a significant capital budget, if we want to have a significant increase for the BSA, well, then we can't have the statutory PFD. Those things are not possible. You cannot do it. And so that's where really... That's really where everybody is going to have to show their cards as individual legislatures and as caucuses. Eventually, the vote will come to will come as to, OK, where are you on the full PFD versus having a meaningful capital budget and having a meaningful increase to the BSA? You have to choose. Nowhere in that discussion by Ortiz or any other member of that delegation is. And we're willing to pay our our proportionate right. share. As top no, yeah. members, we're as reti- state retirees with a full with with you know mostly tier one retirees, we're willing to contribute our proportionate share to these costs. Or right. nowhere in this discussion is there a well, we have to we have to balance on the revenue side. We have to balance who we take this money from. We want a fair and equitable resolution on the revenue side, the same way we want it. None of that. None of that. These guys are just all they're in it for additional spending. These so-called moderates are in it for additional spending. But when it comes to who pays, you, you see that their backsides as they're running out the door. Not me, not me, not me. Push it to middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. It, it is it is the ultimate. When, when viewed from the perspective of, of understanding what moderates normally are in the lower 48, it is the ultimate in hypocrisy uh, that we're getting out of uh, out of these Alaska moderates. It's interesting because this is the same kind of hypocrisy we saw during the veto debate with Governor Dunleavy. Oh, cut, cut, cut. Oh, but don't cut in my don't cut in my district because that's we could have cuts, but just not there. It's the same kind of thing. Nobody wants to acknowledge that everybody is going to have to feel some pain if we want to uh, if we want to either continue to spend at the current level or cut down from the current level. Uh, somebody's going to have to feel the pain. We can't just keep going on. And that's part of the problem here is everybody is ignoring the overall problem, which is a tremendous appetite for spending. Yep. And, and no, and no recognition. Well, not only no recognition, a refusal of recognition of the impact is having, uh, of of the revenue impact is the impact it's having on the revenue side on middle and lower income Alaska families. It's like, it's like somehow magically PFDs don't cutting the PFD don't, doesn't impact people. It's the same thing as saying magically taxes don't impact people, right? I mean, income taxes, uh, impact people, sales taxes, impact people. PFD cuts are just another variation of that. They're a head tax, what Hammond called a head tax and, and they impact people, but there's no recognition of, of the impact. A lot of these people go around saying, oh, we got to do it for middle and lower income Alaska families. We've got to give them a leg up. We've got to, you know, we got to have a, a better education system. We've got to have a better defined benefit system. We've got to have a better, you know, uh, university system to give middle and lower income Alaska, Alaska families a leg up. Uh, guys, are you watching what you're doing on the revenue side? You're taking it out of middle and lower income Alaska families. The top 20% 
are, are laughing all the way to the bank. They're contributing virtually nothing to, to these costs. You're just, you're just, what you're doing is you're deciding how middle and lower income Alaska families spend their money. You're taking it. You're saying, yeah, you don't need that money. We need it. And we're going to spend it for you on all these good things. The top 20% who also benefit, who are, who are in the front lines of saying, we need spending. We need K through 12. They, you know, they're out in front saying that's, that's good for Alaska. Well, if it's a good, if it's good for Alaska, pay for it, a, a portion of it yourselves. No, no, no. We don't want to do that. It's right. just, Michael, it's, it's just one of the, you know, viewed from the perspective of, of somebody who understands fiscal policy, viewed from the perspective of someone who sees how this plays out in the lower 48. It's just a joke in Alaska, what these so-called moderates are doing. It's it's spend, 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 but don't make me pay for it. Let's just shove the cost down on middle and lower income Alaska families. They won't, they won't care. They'll, they'll be fine. We'll just we'll just explain it's 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 for their own good. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. And that, of course, nobody wants to say the uh, the dreaded tax word. They, nobody wants to even acknowledge that the dreaded tax word is already in effect on the PFD. That's the thing. They, they've already made the they've already, And you could hear it in Ortiz's comments there. He's already made the decision that the PFD is the only bag of money to draw from from everything else. I, it's just, I mean, the, it, it either comes from the PFD uh, or it comes from the earnings reserve. What what universe is Dan living in? There is another option. It's person you've got a personal income tax going on middle and lower income fa families in the form of PFD cuts. Just broaden the middle the 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 personal income tax to everybody and include non residents, so you get a a ten percent bump. I mean, ten percent of the costs are covered by non residents, so you don't have to cover that from middle and lower income, or you don't have to cover that from any Alaska families. Middle right. and lower income or higher income Alaska families, um, but not, rather than that, rather than talk about what truly would be a moderate revenue proposal, re a moderate proposal on the revenue side, rather than talk about that, they just ignore it, assume it away, and say, "Oh yeah, this 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 revenue proposal that you know benefits me as a member of the top twenty percent, yeah, that, that's the one I want to go with." Before your head explodes, <laughs> I, I, I think well, we it's just. Do it, it, it is just frustrating. It's just right. frustrating to see people get away with claiming the moderate. I mean, the, the, the press lets them get away with it. The bloggers let them get away with it. They're moderates. No, they aren't. They're hypocritical elitists is what they yeah, are. Well, yeah, they're Li big limousine government. liberals. You know, they're big government people. I mean, right. This is not a this is not liberal, conservative, de Democrat, Republican. This is big government versus limited, more restricted, smaller government. That's all it is. That, that I mean, it doesn't matter. We've got R's doing it. We've got D's doing it. It doesn't matter. They're pro-government, pro-big government. That's the end of the story. All right, let's move over to... Uh, no, no, I want, I want to stay on this forever. I, it's just... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Blood <laughs> from your eyes. Any thoughts on, speaking of, uh, speaking of hypocrisy, any thoughts on the uh, HB 22, the defined benefits uh, plan being rammed through uh, community and regional affairs at uh, at warp speed and then coming out at the other end without a fiscal note. I mean, because the vote has now happened, right? So the vote's over, but it can't go anywhere because it doesn't have a fiscal note attached to it. Uh, and they may not be able to get to a fiscal note for maybe a month or something. So any thoughts on that whole thing? Oh, it's uh, CJ. It, it's the it's the Bush caucus uh, showing their power by CJ ramming it through the committee. And, and he got the, the freshman Republicans, and the freshman Democrats on the committee to to support it, because after all, it's K through 12. It's for the children and and. and or in, in a, in a, uh, in a, in a, uh, well, that, that particular bill is not fire, for the children. It's for the it's firefighters. It's for, for the firefighters. It's for somebody. The first, uh, right. I know it's somebody has got to, don't you love children, hamsters, squirrels, and police? Oh, it was police. That was it. That's it. But it's just, I mean, it's, it's them, it's them showing the power, their, their power to do it, do it. But that bill's got what, if Kevin's on, he'll know it's either got three referrals or four referrals. It's like, it's like it's the death. Four. Yeah, it's got four referrals total, so, but so it's like the death knell. I mean, it's it. Yeah, it 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 rarely something that has four referrals barely gets to the uh, uh, barely gets to the finance committee, much less to the floor of the House of Origin, much less crosses over and gets to the gets to the other body. 
Um, so it's it's unlikely to to, to go anywhere. But I think it is. So it was a signaling. It was a signaling by CJ that look the Bush powers got uh, got uh, uh, control here, and I'm and I'm going to exercise my powers as chairman of the committee to show you that control and some signaling by the freshmen that hey, we're not going to you know we're not we're not going to be your father's conservative, I guess. Um, uh, and, uh, and we're going to vote for, uh, we're going to vote for things like this. So, you know, they're out there. Uh, I think McKay and, and, uh, uh, and, uh, 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 the others, uh, that voted against it, um, you know, made showed common sense by saying, wait, let's slow down. Let's consider all the aspects of this. Let's get a fiscal note on it. Uh, but there's the, they wanted to get the signal out there. They got it out there. Andy Josephson got a signal out there that, hey, you know, even as a even in the minority, I can push things and I can get things through committee. OK, great. I, yeah, he, you may have killed your bill doing it because nobody's going to want to touch it from here on out. But OK, um, so it's it, it's just one of it. It's it's one. It's sort of it's sort of like sort of like Senate going all in on K through 12 spending, which is where my brain was earlier. Senate going all in on K through 12 spending right from the beginning. You know, let's not build up a constituency. Let's not, you know, let's not look at the various aspects of this. Let's just get this bill going. Let's just get these dollars going. And, um, and it's a signal. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's a way of signaling that to their constituencies, constituencies that that's what they're doing. Jamie Allard, on the other hand, the chair of the house education, house education committee, gave her signal also she didn't even show up for her first committee meeting so yes wow. it's uh wow we, we got we got signals going all over the place um uh, but but that's what you get in the early part of the session you get signaling actions you don't get actions that really have a lot right. of meaning meaning they're just actions designed to get headlines well it'll be interesting to watch how this all shakes out but i just found it very you know that those first those first moves seem to set the tone right and so it, the first move is we're going to blitzkrieg this through the committees and try and get it done. Uh, you could see exactly where and the strong arming that's going on is definitely um, is definitely an interesting uh, uh, situation. Yeah, it, I, I mean, Kevin and Kevin and McCabe and Tom K were right to, to try to slow it down. And they were right in the points they made. Um, and I and I don't. You know, some people are saying, oh, well, they should have read the bill, uh, whichever. I think it was McKay who said he hadn't read the bill yet. I, yeah, I mean, you, you, that's not the way the legislative process works. And but it's that's what that's the signal they wanted to send. They wanted to show that they could steamroll something that the Bush caucus with CJ as chairman could steamroll something. So, OK, there's your signal. You got it. Congratulations. Right. right. You have the power. We admit you have the power. It's all fine. We're all we're all good to go. Uh, number two, the Willow Project and fiscal uncertainty. Go for it. Well, the Willow Project is great. So BLM this past week came out with a decision, a preliminary decision that will be finalized uh, somewhere in the 30 plus day range, a preliminary decision that they're going to allow three pads uh, at the Willow Project. What Conoco, Conoco had proposed five had said that when, when it got rejected by the courts, came back to the agency and to the company, they essentially worked out a deal for three. Conoco said it could live with three. If it got cut down below three, it got cut to two, as, as many had proposed, uh, then they couldn't live with it. It wouldn't be an economic project and they weren't going to go forward. They weren't going to be able to develop enough reserves out of two pads to be able to make the project, to be able to make the, the high investment required um, uh, economic. And the BLM's come out with a preliminary decision that says three pads, uh, not five, as you originally proposed, not two, as, uh, as, as others had proposed. We're going to go with three pads. And Conoco said that makes it economic. Conoco's had very good words about it since. But, you know, some are, some are reacting, uh, some in the, in, the, in the community are reacting, saying happy days are here again. Uh, because wow, more productions coming, huge numbers of product of additional production. Uh, we're in the money. Uh, fiscal po uh, problems have gone away. And and what I want to discuss in the second segment is uh, that that economically, this is good for Alaska, very good for Alaska, and I'll explain why economically it's very good for Alaska. Uh, but from a fiscal standpoint, it's not happy days are here again. And I'll explain why the way that. Uh, royalty works on federal lands and the way our uh, severance tax structure works, why it's not happy days are here again just because the Willow Project's been approved. 
Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, continues with us here this morning. Uh, Brad, we were talking about number two, the uh, potential, the good news on Willow from the BLM report, but also how that there's still fiscal uncertainty on that. Uh, what's what's happening? Well, let's let's talk about Willow from two perspectives quickly. One is from the economic perspective. It's great for Alaska. There will be construction involved. There will be people hired. There will be materials required. There will be transportation up to the slope required. There will be, you know, a, 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 a contractors hired to do to do a number of things. That is great for the Alaska economy. When people say oil drives our economy. What really drives our economy is oil construction, is oil development, is hiring people to do oil development. Once you get the thing built, like Prudhoe, you sort of ramp down the, the, the need for people, you ramp down the need for contractors, um, you ramp down the need for uh, uh, various ancillary services. But in the construction phase, in the development phase, you really, you, you bring on a lot of contractors, a lot of people. So it's, it's great for the, the, the it's great for the Alaska economy. It's, it's very welcome news for the Alaska economy. Some people then translate that and say, oh, well, it's also great for Alaska fiscal. It's not. Um, particularly something like Willow. Willow's on federal lands. And the royalty uh, uh, due from Willow, the oil royalty due from Willow, goes to the federal government. The federal government's got a, got a statute that divides that royalty 50% to the federal unrestricted general fund, essentially. And the other 50% dedicated for Alaska Native communities uh, in on the on the slope programs for Alaska Native communities on the slope. None of it, none of the royalty comes to the state uh, to the state general fund. Production taxes, uh, production taxes have a essentially a tax holiday at the front end uh, for new production. Um, I can't remember if it's five or seven years. It got changed somewhere along the way. But there's a essentially a production holiday for new for new developments. That was done as part of as part of the the overall uh, uh, tax legislation, oil tax legislation in 2013. It was done as an incentive for additional development to give an economic benefit uh, to an additional economic benefit to new development. And so there's there's no taxes that will come uh, quickly out of out of Willow. And in fact, because of the way the the, uh, the deductions work, we have a net profit system, a net profits oil tax system. Because of the way the deductions work, actually Willow in the early stages, in the, in the development stages, will be a negative to our tax system because you can they'll be able to, Conoco will be able to deduct the expenses of, right. of developing Willow uh, from, their, from their otherwise tax bill. And there won't be right. any offsetting revenue from from the additional revenue that will, or from the additional production that will, that will offset that. So you look, when you look at the 10 year plan, for example, you see production ramping up, but you actually see revenues ramping down and, and oil revenues ramping down. And that's not because in part it's due to the drop in oil prices. Uh, but it's also due to the, to the impact of those, of those development costs uh, running through the, uh, the deductions to, uh, to the tax. So it's, it's, it, Willow is a great deal. It indicates that we can at least get some oil development on federal lands um, and, and says that the federal government's not shutting us down completely, which is a very good message to send. It's a great message for the economy because it means more employment, more construct, more contractors, more construction, more building on the slope. Great message for the economy, but don't, don't, you know, don't try to steal second on it and say, oh, but it's also great for Alaska fiscal because it, do it doesn't have the sort of impact that you're thinking on Alaska fiscal. Don't uh, doesn't don't we have a isn't there a 90 10 deal in place to the on federal lands too? don't we at least get 10 percent of the split um, at one point on the royalties? That's is that's Anwar, I think. Is it on, just Anwar, or is it on all federal lands? I think so. NPRA NPRA, it's 50 50 on the federal royalty. Um, and it's fifty percent to the federal to federal coffers, fifty percent to, to this de dedicated fund or designated fund for the benefit of, uh, of native communities on the slope. So I don't I don't think well I I know there's no revenue that comes to uh, comes to the state coffers directly to the state coffers out of the uh, uh, out of the uh, uh, out of the royalty side. There's some I mean there's some indirect effect, effect to the extent you have some federal money going to native communities on the slope, then you don't need to worry as much about 
about state support to those communities, but it's certainly not a one for one uh, trade off. Right. All right. Well, so that's number two in the column of uh, be careful what you wish for. Uh, you know, that, like you said, good news on the one hand, not necessarily good news fiscally uh, in the long run. We just get the bump on construction and then it drifts, it drifts off, right? And fades away in the long run. Yeah, well, and, and eventually the tax holiday, the early early years tax holiday goes away and we do get production taxes from it. But it's not going to be, it's not like Prudhoe where we get both royalty or what Pico would be where we get both royalty and production taxes. It'll just be the production taxes. And if oil continues to decline in those out years, then the value of those production uh, taxes will decline as well. It's it's just don't don't think we've don't think we've solved Alaska fiscal on the basis of the Willow approval inside you know a span of fifteen years. It's not it's not going to have that effect. Right. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, the weekly top three. That was number two, uh, which leads us down to number three, which is a discussion about Cook Inlet gas production and why. It seems like some folks continue to channel Rahm Emanuel in never let a crisis go to waste. Brad, what is your thought on this discussion in the Senate briefing on the future of Cook Inlet gas? Well, the sleeper issue this session, I think, is is beginning to look like the Cook Inlet uh, gas decline. Uh, Hillcorp has said uh, we're running out of gas in the Cook Inlet. We're running out of gas that we've developed or we an anticipate developing um, in the Cook Inlet, and uh, and so you know you the, those those dependent on the Cook Inlet, the utilities, NSTAR, um, uh, the electric utilities uh, that that are reliant on Cook Inlet gas. Uh, you need to start you need to start fending for yourself, and among other things, they're looking at an increased investment in renewables or increased renewable uh, uh, power generation, and they're looking at bringing LNG in to supplement the LNG. The, the thing the thing that that I'm concerned about I, I we've had this before we had it in 2010 2011 we had a cook inlet crisis in 2010 2011 the mayor Dan Sullivan was the mayor at the time he established a commission to look into it the legislature looked in it, into it the ultimate result of that was a bunch of credits um, oil and gas tax credits reimbursable oil and tax tax credits uh, that the legislature created to essentially pay for the to pay uh, 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 oil and gas companies to develop additional reserves in the Cook Inlet, Hillcorp, because of the timing of when it bought uh, the properties from from Chevron and Marathon, Hillcorp was the major beneficiary of that uh, in the Cook Inlet. But there were other beneficiaries in the Cook Inlet, and and that oil and gas tax credit program was was credited, uh, perhaps not fairly so, but credited with with you know staving off the 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 concerns we had in the, in the early 20 teens about, uh, about you know, declining cook inlet gas production. Um, we're having this same, the same sort of thing is now coming up again, the same sort of drive. And, and it doesn't take much for somebody to try to tip that into, Oh, and we need oil and gas tax credits again to, to encourage, to incentivize development uh, in, uh, in oil and gas development in the lower 48 and Hillcorp, I'm sure would be saying, well, we've got projects. But the projects aren't economic right now. You know, they they, they don't they don't pass muster uh, for the for the dollars we have. Now, if you have some credits, maybe we could you know get in there and do that. I, I it doesn't take much to try to tip this crisis, the Cook Inlet gas crisis, uh, into an opportunity for somebody to say, hey, we need more state money in order to fix this. Um, and so I'm a little concerned that what we're seeing is sort of the same thing over again that we saw in 2010. 2011, 2012, the drumbeat beginning for state needs to get involved in this. The state needs to have needs to do oil and gas tax credits again. They were successful last time, um, and uh, and and start pushing in that direction. And you know, we ultimately got the oil and tax credit, the reimbursable oil and gas tax credit uh, program uh, uh, expired, terminated in the in the mid 20 teens. But after we'd paid out a hell of a lot of money, uh, mostly from the CBR. Uh, uh, to, to reimburse those to oil and gas tax credits. So I'm, I'm concerned that we're beginning to see the drumbeat. And as I was reading this article, I was, uh, I was thinking to myself, Rahm Emanuel, do not let a, cri good, a crisis go to waste. Who is sitting there going, uh, I'm not going to let this crisis go to waste. I'm going to turn it into dollars and cents, uh, dollars and cents for me and my friends by saying, by telling the legislature, we'll solve this 
if you if you if only if you if you if you only would give us money uh, to go back out and develop these additional reserves. So I'm I'm troubled by it. Well, and uh, I mean, I guess we should all be paying attention to it. I mean, it's no lie that the gas reserves are declining. The question is, are the are the projects truly, um, you know, not fiscally feasible, or is it just is this is this the 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 carrot the trap is this the trap is this is this what it's about? Do you think? There, there is a, there is a problem in the Cook Inlet. The Cook Inlet, we have a very small market in Alaska. We used to export gas uh, uh, out of a gas uh, LNG out of Alaska, but we stopped that. We have a very small market, so it's really hard to 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 do the economics of projects in the Cook Inlet because if you if you have a huge success, then you flooded the market. You aren't going to be able to market your gas, and the price of your gas is likely going to go down. So you you. You really, you can't, it's hard to do the economics, but, but oil and gas tax credits don't make those economics any better. They don't change the, the dynamic of the market. They don't increase demand in the market uh, for, for the, for new projects. They just sort of subsidize you for developing gas and then holding onto it for a while until you can have the next crisis and ask for credits again. So it, I mean, there is a, there is a problem in the Cook Inlet. Frankly, LNG may be the best option. It may be the most economic option. Now, what people do is go, LNG, no, nah, we're not going to do that. In the in the 2010s, Sean Parnell, I mean, LNG would pro was probably the best option, better than the oil and gas tax credits, but Parnell said, oh, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do LNG. We're not going to bring LNG into Alaska. So figure something else out. And what we finally figured out was to do the oil and gas tax credits. But um, you, people are going are gonna to have this allergic reaction to LNG. They shouldn't. It should be considered as, as one of the options. I'm obviously as somebody who lives in South Central and who has definitely benefited from uh, definitely benefited from oil and gas or from uh, gas, I guess, you know, financially. I'm a little concerned about, you know, where 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 we go from here, because that, you know, that makes a huge difference. I mean, I've, I've said it many times. I have made. Uh, I've saved thousands and thousands of dollars uh, on my heating and, and uh, electricity and, and, you know, everything else from oil and gas, uh, and specifically from gas. So I am a little concerned about what's going on in the Cook Inlet. Uh, I just don't know if it's a real problem or if it's just they'll wait to the last minute to try and squeeze it in. Well... If you use the Rahm Emanuel approach, you'll wait to the last minute and try to squeeze it in because then then your options will be limited, right? You need to start on LNG early. If you're going to develop renewables, you need to start on renewables early. If you wait to the last minute to do it, then then oh my God, you know then then Hillcorp may say, oh I got this field out there, but it's not economic to develop it. It'd be nice if it'd be nice if I had this subsidy to go develop it. Yeah. It's um, it, it's just I mean it it it's coming on as the sleeper issue. I, I've heard more and more people talk about it. It's gotten more and more press. There's more and more urgency to it. If I were a utility executive, I'd be concerned about it too. But let's just, let's control the the discussion and look, you know, uh, look uh, 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 holistically at the various options and let's be diligent in doing the economics of the various options. Let's not just run to the, to the, to the edge of the boat and say, oh my God, we got to do oil and gas tax credits again. No one, no one's really pushing that yet. But this is the same drumbeat I saw in the early 20 teens, and I and I and I've seen this movie before, and and I know where this movie starts heading. Um, so, uh, and Kathy Giesel was one of the primary movers of it, and she's chair of Senate Resources this time around. So, I'm just I'm very I'm very cautious about this, and and I and I see the sort of drumbeat that we saw in the 20 teens about there's a crisis, we've got to do something about it, we've got to act now, we've got to oh and. And the producers tell us if we give them some more credits, maybe they can find some projects out. It's just we need to be very careful about that. And we need to consider the economics of all the options before we go plunging off. And it's good. And it's good we're starting early. I mean, relatively someone, early. Someone in the chat room just said, why are you giving the legislator ideas? Uh, don't you just love it when Brad gives the legislators bad ideas? I, they probably thought of this. I mean, right? I mean, you're not maybe letting anything out of the bag. Maybe. I don't know. Hillcorp isn't dumb. <laughs> I mean, Hillcorp Hillcorp knows where they made a bunch of money in the early 20 teens. They know what it would. They know it'd be nice to have that money again. I mean, yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not giving the legislators any ideas that the lobbyists haven't already given them. Right. 
Um, any final thoughts here, Brad, before we let you go for today? I mean, things this week, things we need to be watching for, just overall final thoughts. You want me to go back to hypocrisy for a while? <laughs> yeah, you can go back to hypocrisy if you want. That's the thing. No, it's I, the the things I'm watching this week. I, um, ways and or ways and means, house ways and means. I continue to watch. I continue to to want to get a sense for where that's going. Uh, they've been charged with developing the fiscal plan. Ben's the chair. Donna's on the on the on the staff. It'll be interesting to see where that goes. I, if it if it goes down the line of the fiscal policy working group and includes uh, uh, substitute revenues, includes uh, a, a component for substitute revenues. Then I then I think it's I think it's got a chance if it if it goes off in the direction that 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 Ben would would naturally want to take it, which is spending cuts. Then I then it's going to become an irrelevant committee. But it it had a it had a good f- first hearing. It had a good second hearing. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I want I want to continue to watch and see where that committee goes. I think it could be a very a very helpful committee as it as it develops. Speaking of that. Um... I, speaking of hypocrisy, I thought blood would be shooting out of your eyes when you read the ADN article on Donna Ardwin's return to the uh, legislature. Did you read the piece and see Stedman's comment? Yeah. 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 No. I mean, I mean that, that there was those, just no, there's no analysis by Ardwin about the impacts of the cuts being proposed by the governor. The impact. Of, I mean, but no talk about any of the impacts of the spending that they want to do or the cuts that they want to do or anything else. No impacts on any of that. I could just see you shaking your head. It's uh, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, that war is still fresh in everybody's mind. I'm not uh, it, it's not going to it's not going to be forgotten for a long, long period of time. So but I, but the committee, the committee is important. And uh, and and hopefully the committee is on track uh, uh, to 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 truly flesh out uh, the uh, the fiscal policy working groups uh, uh, recommendations and to truly come up with an all of the above uh, strategy if it does uh, I think I think that uh, I think that committee is going to do a substantial service to the state well I hope so uh, Donna says ways and means meets Mondays and and Wednesdays at 6 p.m That's so right. t- tune your dial tune your clock and go over there and get it done. All right, uh, Brad, uh, thanks for coming on board and joining us. I appreciate it. I hope we didn't d- damage your blood pressure uh, too badly <laughs> with that first hypocrisy thing. Uh, it's, no, you, you let me vent. It was otherwise building up, right? I got to tell you, it's it's ironic. We see this hypocrisy at many levels in the state government. And uh, the moderates is one thing. It's when we see it from supposedly the more conservative side that we still get even more frustrated. But this is something we've been dealing with for a long time. So I appreciate you coming in and shining the light on it. Thank you so much for being part of it today. Michael, thanks for having me. All right. We appreciate you uh, coming on board. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.